Amen, amen. Thank you, worship team. Hey, good morning, church family. You can have a seat. It's so good to see you. If you're new to Adventure or watching online, I want to say welcome. If you don't know me, my name is Deshaun. I'm one of the pastors here at Adventure Church. And we have two amazing senior pastors, Pastor Anthony and Mandy Flores. Can we give them a hand? Give them some honor. Man, it's a privilege to serve underneath them. I never want to be a senior pastor. I don't care if I'm a pastor, but all I want to do is serve underneath them because they are following God, and I'm going to follow them as they follow Christ. And I'm going to be obedient to whatever they ask me to do. And I'm so thankful for those two individuals who are leading our church. If you don't know that we're right now in the book of Hebrews, and we're going through the book, and today we'll actually be in Hebrews chapter 5, going into Hebrews chapter 6 a little bit. But in, in um, the Bible, from Genesis to Revelations, we see these warning signs that God is warning people to repent of their sin, to turn away from their sin, and turn towards the grace of God. Turn away from that sin that leads to death and turn towards that grace that brings salvation. The problem is a lot of people don't like that. We don't like when people call out sin in our lives. It doesn't feel loving, people will say. A lot of people say Jesus wouldn't say anything like that. He would just simply say, love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't bring any judgment whatsoever. I want to share, I wrote this. The love and compassion of God is always accompanied with the truth. It's always accompanied with the truth. It, it, and I wasn't going to put the truth of God, but the reason I just put the truth, because anything that's outside of God is a lie in the first place. So truth by definition is only that what comes from God. So if you are offended by the gospel, so I put this, if you, feel atta- if you feel personally attacked when you hear the gospel, you must stop identifying yourself with that which God calls sin. People feel personally attacked when they hear the gospel because they are identifying themselves by what God calls sin. He's calling that out. But I'm here to tell you, you are not your sin. I don't care what people are telling you, you cannot identify yourself as your sin. No, God has came, that he came to free you from your sin, that you may become a child of the Almighty God. You are not your sin. If you hear the gospel and you feel offended, it's because you're identifying yourself by your sin. And God said, I came to set you free from that sin. I come to give you grace and peace in your life. He has come to set us free. For example, in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The love of God to send his son so that you won't perish. But if you don't believe, you will perish in your sin. It is that love, but there's also that truth in there that people want to reject because it calls out our sin. But realize you are not your sin. God gets to define you, and you are a child of the Almighty God. And he loves and he cares for you. In Hebrews chapter 5, starting at verse 11, it says this. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not equated with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who, by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish between good and evil. Therefore, let let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying in the foundation of repentance from acts that leads to death and faith in God. Instructions about, instructions about cleansing rites, laying on the hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. It is impossible for those who once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of God, and the word of God, and the powers in the age to come, who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again, and subject him to public disgrace. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you now. Lord, seeking only to glorify your name above all else. Lord, that we renew our faith, Father God, unto you. 
Lord, that we repent of our sins, Father God, and come unto you, Father God. Lord, would you use me to speak unto your people? Lord, that we will break the patterns of sin of our life, Father God, and truly to seek after you and your righteousness. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jerome. In Hebrews chapter 5, again, verse 11, it says this, We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. We see here that the writer of Hebrews seems to get frustrated with the readers. He says, we have much to say about this. He was telling them before that there's no need for the priesthood in chapter 5, that Jesus is now the everlasting uh, priest, that it's through, eternal salvation comes through him. He's telling the Jewish people, he's telling the Hebrews, you can leave the, the priesthood behind. You can leave your old traditions behind. Jesus is now the source of eternal salvation. He's been telling us as we go through Hebrews, have you seen that he is greater than the angels, greater than the prophets, greater than Moses. But he said it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. He tells them that, hey, you, by now you guys should have been teachers. You should have been teaching and leading people. But I still have to tell you the elementary things of the gospel. We have to go back to all these other things that we talked about before. And I have to explain to you how God has fulfilled all these laws, that you don't have to do all these rules and regulations anymore. He's, saying, he's telling them, can we move forward? He says, you still need milk. Still need to be taught about salvation, and that works doesn't bring salvation. So I want to look at this idea of milk and solid food as he's writing to the Hebrews. He says this, milk is for people who don't understand righteousness. And solid food is for those who have been trained to distinguish between good and bad. So milk is for people who are still trying to understand righteousness. They're still trying to figure out, well, how could I get right with God? The Jewish people of their time, they did all these laws and rituals to get right with God. And he's saying, you don't have to do those things anymore. Look past that. Get off of the milk. I think we, in our lives today, we see this. We see that how we get stuck on that milk. How do I get right with God? And he's trying to tell them, no, it's only through grace. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it says this. It's for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. It is simply through grace. It's nothing to do with you. Simply putting your faith in him. In Romans 5.20, it says, The law was brought to us that trespasses might increase, but where sin increased, uh, sin increased, grace increased all the more. I don't care how much sin you had in your life, there is enough grace to cover it. Amen? I don't care what sin you commit in your life, there is enough grace to cover it. It says where sin increases, grace increases all the more. And I'm truly thankful for that because I need grace. That I know no matter what I do, there's enough grace to cover my sin. But the question always comes up, so then should I keep sinning that grace may continue to increase? Can I keep just doing what I want to do and be good? In Romans 6, Paul says this, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. We should be looking to offer ourselves for God's use. Before in the past, we're using our bodies as an instrument of wickedness. Now we're supposed to be looking to use our bodies for righteous things, for holy things. And this is where I believe that so many believers, so many in the church get stuck. We're trying to see what can I get away with. We're not looking to give ourselves away to God. We're trying to see how little can I give myself to God and still be a Christian. Check out this example in Proverbs. It says in 6, 27, can a man scoop fire in his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? That we try to see how, as a believer, how close can I get to the fire without getting burned? How close can I get to that sin without being burned? How close, how warm can I get next to that? How can I cozy up to that sin and still be a believer? We try to see how much sin can I keep in my life? How much sin is okay to be in my life and still be a believer? 
We need to change our thinking. We need to get off of the milk of illness of thinking, how am I right with God? And know that you're right with God and move forward. And start offering ourselves as instrument of righteousness. God, how much of myself can I give away? Not how little can I give away? He says when we're in that situation, you're simply to say infant, trying to understand righteousness. Understanding, I'm not sure if I'm right with God today. But he says, can we move on, move on to maturity? Now, solid food, he said, or for those who have been trained, to distinguish between good and bad. In 2 Timothy 2.22, it says this, Flee evil desires of your youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord, out, call on the Lord out of a pure heart. That we need to seek after the Lord. We need to seek after righteousness, and we need to flee evil desires. Anyone like to run in here? No? Nope. Oh, man, my people. I hate running, too. I go to the gym almost every day, and I do no running. I do no cardio. Don't like it. Never liked it when I was a kid. I used to like doing sprints maybe one time, you know, 10 seconds of running, and you're all good. But running for, you know, running for 30 minutes, an hour sounds ridiculous to me. It doesn't sound fun. But as believers, we need to be marathon runners. We got to be runners. We got to run from those evil desires. It says flee those evil desires and pursue righteousness, love, and peace. We need to run from those evil desires and start pursuing something. And the reason I say we got to be marathon runners is that we're going to be running all our lives. You, all your life, you're going to be pursuing righteousness because sin is always going to be behind you. Your evil desires are always going to be behind you, and you have to shun them. You have to push them back and keep pursuing God. We're going to have to be spiritual marathon runners, continually seeking after righteousness. In 1 Corinthians 9, it says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way to get the prize, he says. Everyone who competes in the games into, goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. People train hard every day to get a crown that's simply going to be gone, but we, he says, we go to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul said, I go into strict training so I may win the prize, that I will go forward, that even when I'm done preaching, I don't disqualify for myself, that he even has to have some discipline. Now, this may sound daunting, you're like, man, running, I don't like to run in the physical, and I, running in the spiritual sounds just as exhausting. <laughs> but I want to tell you, in Galatians 6, 9, says this, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Don't give up. God is going to show up, and he is going to reward you. <laughs> Keep moving forward. Keep running. Keep fleeing unrighteousness. Keep fleeing from sin and run after righteousness. God is going to show up, and he's going to come through. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he always provides a way out so that you can endure. So when you run and you get tired, you end up slowing down a little bit in the spiritual race. And you start flirting with sin and now you're being tempted. It says, God's got you. He'll provide a way out. He knows you might get tired. You might grow weary. He said, I will provide a way out when you're in that situation. No, at any time, it is, it is not sin until you actually commit it. Temptation is not sin. He'll provide a way out for you. And believer, in the time will come where you do fall. And do you do make that mistake? Know this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive you, forgive us of our sins and purify, purify us of all unrighteousness. If you confess your sin to God, he will forgive you. The devil wants to beat you up for your sin. God wants to forgive you. The world might want to beat you up for your sin. God wants to forgive you. Will you confess it? He will forgive you. So I say run that race. 
flee temptation and run out of righteousness. God is a loving God. He provides that way out. He'll help you and he'll forgive you. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter, now we're going to flow into chapter 6 and I did my best to make this as simple as possible. Hebrews chapter 6 is a great controversy. There's so many different opinions on this and let me, let me read it. It won't come up on the board, but it says this. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about Christ, let us press forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, dead works of faith towards God. First, we see here that he's saying, again, leave those old things in the past. Leave those old rituals, washing of hands, all the ceremony things that the Jews used to do. He says, leave it behind. Christ has came and he's fulfilled all those things. He's greater than all those things. Stop trying to earn your salvation, he's telling them. He says, stop being infants. Be mature. Pursue God and his righteousness. And this is the part that is a great debate in verses 4, 5, and 6. It says this, For it is impossible for those who once been enlightened, who has tasted the heavenly gift, who has shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God, and the powers of age to come, who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again. Paul is writing and saying that there is a group of people who knew God, let me put it up here, who had all these things, who once were enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted the goodness of God and the word of God, yet they fall away and not able to come back into repentance. That they experience all these things, but, and they fall away, and they can't come back to faith in Christ. This is why it's so much debate. It's like, what, who are these people who can't come back? To, how is that possible that they can't come back to Christ? Through this, Paul has been talking about growing mature. And he's saying that you need to leave the milk behind. That these people experience all these things, yet they fall away and not able to come to repentance. And I believe it's because they harden their hearts. Now imagine they experience all these things. And they're on that fence, not fully giving themselves, up to, giving themselves unto God. But God, how little can I give you? Can I live in the world? Can I keep that sin in my life? And God's speaking to them. Convicting them of their sin. The Holy Spirit is speaking to them and saying, repent and come unto me. And they keep rejecting him. They keep rejecting the voice of God. They keep rejecting the Holy Spirit. And they begin to harden their hearts. It, begins, it becomes easy to reject the voice of God. They're no longer convicted by the voice of God anymore. And the Holy Spirit is easy just to shun and push it to the side. And who brings us repentance? Who brings us about salvation? It's the Holy Spirit. I believe this is a warning. We see all these warnings to the Bible. This is another warning that he's given us. Are you still being sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Are you listening to his voice? Because these people experience all these things, but never truly gave themselves over to God. Stop listening to the voice and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, holding on to that sin, seeing how close can they stay to that fire. And now their hearts are harder and they can't respond to the word of God anymore. They're able to drown out that voice. They train themselves not to hear the word of God anymore. And I believe this is a warning. It's a warning to me, Deshaun. I don't care if you preach the word. I don't care if you're here serving that adventure. If you're not listening to me, if you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, you will fall away and you'll be out there saying, I know all those things. Well, who cares? And I will fall away, but I need to keep pursuing God and his righteousness. God, you can speak to me. I will obey you. I will listen to you. Because just like the sun, it hardens some things and it softens some things. When you hear the word of God being preached, when you hear the spirit of God speaking to you, is it hardening your heart or is it softening it? The more God is speaking to you and you keep listening, you train yourself not to listen to the voice of God. You make it easier for yourself to harden your heart. We need to get past, am I right with God? How much sin can I have in my life? 
But when God speaks to you, that you reject those things. You reject those things that God doesn't want, and you pursue him and his righteousness. In Hebrews, seven, uh, Hebrews 3, 7 through 8, it says this. So as the Holy Spirit says, uh, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in, the, in rebellion during the time of testing in, wilder, in the wilderness. That people, the people who left the promised land never got, to, who left Egypt never got to enter the promised land because they hardened their hearts to the voice of God. They stopped listening. So today, if you hear God speaking to you, will you respond? Today, if God's been speaking something to you that you need to cut out of your life, will you respond? Because you not push it to next week because you might not have next week. Next week, your heart might be too hard to even listen. There's so many people out there that know the word of God who can preach it but reject him because of the hardness of their heart. That their conscience has been so seared that they don't care that they're in sin. That God can't even speak to them no more because they train themselves to be disobedient to the word of God and to his voice. In Hebrews 3, 4, 3, in Hebrews 3 13 through 14, it says, But encourage one another daily, as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by, by sin's deceitfulness. Sin wants to deceive you and tell you that you're okay in your sin. God still loves you just the way you are. And we begin that way. That's the infant stage of that mill. Yeah, God loves you. Just all you have to do is simply believe and salvation is yours. But when God speaks, continues to speak to you, will you listen or will you drown him out? We must not listen to sin. It wants to deceive us, but listen to the voice of God. We have come to share in Christ. Indeed, if we hold on to our original convictions firmly to the end. Believers. When you first got saved, where there's something that, some conviction that was in your life, something that you wanted to do for the Lord, to go all out for him, some dream that you had that you've let go, would you grab back onto it? Would you grab back onto that thing that you want to do for the Lord, how you wanted to serve him and do all these things? Would you grab back onto it and start pursuing him and serving him and giving your body up for him, not seeing how little you can give to him? Will you pursue him? Will you listen to the voice of the Lord? I'm not saying listen to the voice of men. I'm not saying listen to the voice of your spouse. I'm saying will you listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in his word? That you don't harden your heart towards him. I can't tell you what to do. But will you let God speak to you and tell you what to do? And second, Peter Three nine it says this: The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises, as some understand. Instead, He is patient with you, not not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Some of us might be living our best lives, still living in sin, living on the fence. But God's just being patient because He wants you to repent, because He loves and cares for you. He still wants to bless you. He is a loving God and saying, would you come to me, my son and my daughter? Would you repent of your sin and pursue me? I desire to have you. I desire to be your father. I desire to be your God. Would you not take advantage of that? And would you truly pursue him and run after him, forsaking all unrighteousness and seeking after God? Man, this hit, when I looked at this scripture... A few weeks ago, it just hit me. And it was like, Deshaun, you need to get back to completely serving the Lord. It, it, and it wasn't, it wasn't something I was doing. I'm doing the work. But in, in my spirit and in my mind, God, I'm focused upon you. I wake up in the morning desire to, what do you have for me, Lord? And I want to hear your voice and live after you. Because it reminded me of Matthew 7. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, we're into the kingdom of heaven but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and do, do not prophesy in your name and drive out, demon, out, drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? He says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. That I realize that what I do won't save me. 
That being a part of Venture Church don't save me. That us getting Tower Theater won't save me. It's only me doing the will of the Father. That I have to pursue him and listen to his voice and his will. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm saying, will you listen to God and do what he tells you to do? It's a danger of holding on to our sin. It's a danger of not fighting, pursuing righteousness. I just want to read, I think I'm just going to read one of these verses. In Romans 1, 21 says this, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were, dark, or, were darkened. Then verse 24 says this, Therefore God gave them over in their evil to their sinful desires. That if we're not careful, God might just give us what we want. All throughout Romans 1, he says he just gave them over to all their sinful desires. That if we're not careful and we keep pursuing the things that aren't of God, God might just give us those things. He might just let us go. That the grace that God has given us to receive him today might not be here tomorrow. And he lets us go and have the sin that we so desire. So would you respond today to what God is speaking to you in your life? Will you not harden your heart and follow after him and pursue his righteousness? Again, the love and compassion of God is always accompanied with the truth. God loves you and he cares for you. I believe that's why he gives these warning signs. That come to me, leave those other things behind. I desire to have you. If I could encourage you with this. In Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, it says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so, e so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you would not grow weary and lose heart. People are rooting for us. As I read that um, earlier, um, a couple days ago, I thought about my grandfather. I said, like, man, he's cheering me on. Just showing you can do it. Keep running that race. There's people cheering you on in heaven saying, you can keep going. You can do it. Listen to the voice of God. I'm telling you that there is a reward for you in heaven. Will you keep going? Will you endure it? Again, if you feel personally attacked when you hear the gospel, you must stop identifying yourself with sin. You must stop identifying yourself by that which God calls sinful. You are not your sin. God is not here to attack you. The gospel is not here to attack you. It's here to set you free. I don't care what people labeled you as or you labeled yourself as. God has come to set you free. <laughs> Leave it behind. Pursue his righteousness. Last things I have for you. We have to be marathon runners. Free from sin and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. When you are tempted, he always provides a way out so that you can endure. And if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive you of our sins. Father God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Father God, I ask, Lord, that you will move in everyone's hearts this morning, Father God. Lord, to know that they're not condemned, but they have been set free by you, Father God. That, Lord, you have love and compassion on them. That you're moved, Father God, to be their God, to be their Father. Lord, would you move in this place and speak to your people. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.